morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. For those of you who are new to the Council Town Hall, we are a 501c3 with the mission of informing our members and audiences about the most compelling international, national, and regional issues. We are a nonpartisan organization, and a very important part of our programs is that we enable our audiences to ask questions of the speakers and panelists to foster a more engaged discussion. We have a special program today in partnership with UCLA. For those of you who are joining us today, we will be taking your questions as usual on the webinar by clicking on the questions section on your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enter your questions there at any time. However, since we're also partnering on today's program with UCLA Anderson, those Anderson students and alumni joining us can submit their questions to Professor Kramer using the audience interactive tool Slido at www.slido.com. Enter the event code 50404, that's 50404. Feel free to note your name and the UCLA affiliation too. And when we get to the question portion, Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will, uh, and today's moderator, Professor Kramer, will alternate between questions on this platform. And those on Slido uh, and those from the World Affairs Council will try to alter those questions um, back and forth. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program a conversation with Juan Enriquez, a futurist, polymath, and venture capitalist, and hosted by UCLA Anderson professor, Terry Kramer. Terry, it's terrific that you're moderating today's program. We can't wait for this very informative conversation. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you so much. Excellent, Kim, a big uh, thank you. And thank you for the partnership between the World Affairs Council and UCLA Anderson on what is gonna be a fascinating discussion on Juan Enriquez's latest book, Right, Wrong, How Technology Transforms Our Ethics. And I can't think of a better time than today. And looking back at developments in our world, whether they be economic, political, public health related, the use of technology, Thinking about all of those recent developments, I think makes this discussion today very, very timely. Now we're fortunate, as I mentioned, to have Juan Enriquez, who I've known for many years, speak with us. And Juan, as you may know, is an author, he's a investor, he's an entrepreneur, he's a thought leader in a lot of different areas. And I'd like to just share a few elements of his background that I think brings all this to life. Um, he's an authority on the economic impact of life sciences and brain research uh, on business and society. He's the founding director of Harvard Business School's Life Sciences Project. He's a research affiliate at MIT's Synthetic Neurobiology Lab. Following his MBA at Harvard Business School, he became an active angel investor. He was the co-founder of Excel Venture Management. He's a business leader and advisor, and in that role, he's had the opportunity to advise a variety of CEOs from Fortune 50 companies. He's had the opportunity to advise various heads of state, all about how to adapt to a world where the dominant language is shifting from digital towards the language of life. He's written several great books and co-authored several as well. Um, multiple bestsellers. And let me just read a couple of them here. He's written the book as the future catches you, how genomics will change your life, work, health, and wealth. He's written the United States of America, polarization, fracturing, and our future. And he's also written evolving ourselves, redesigning humanity one gene at a time. He's a TED all-star. He's done nine different TED talks. He serves on multiple for-profit boards and non-profit boards. Some of the non-profit boards include the National Academy of Sciences, 
the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, WGBH, the Boston Science Museum, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard's David Rockefeller Center. He graduated from Harvard with a BA and an MBA, both with honors. And as Kim mentioned, I'm gonna ask Juan a series of questions up front, and then we will go to a moderated uh, Q&A uh, session. So Juan, first of all, a big welcome. Great to see you again, and thank you for, uh, for making the time today. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be virtually warm with you. I'm sitting up in cold Maine, so I envy all of you in Los Angeles. We are uh, two different coasts here. So, uh, and Juan, I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. I binge read your book a couple of weeks ago, and I just found it interesting in all the areas about the intersection of technology and ethics. And I want to go through a few of my kind of observations reading it to get your thoughts in more detail about several of the points you make um, in the book. So one of the points you make um, that I, I keep thinking about today is that you say that ethics evolve over time and that ethics are not static in nature. Tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that. So, you know, I, I spent most of my time thinking about what happens when you program life forms with synthetic biology and what happens when you can read write the brain and as i was doing that i kept getting more and more questions about ethics and so i thought okay i'll take this seriously i'll write a little set of 10 principles for this and then i'll be done and that was six years ago and so it took me about six years to finally come up with a book on right and wrong and how technology changes our ethics and the basic premise of it is all of us think that we were taught right and wrong by our parents by our peers by our teachers but what people don't understand is how often technology fundamentally changes our notion of right and wrong and let me give you a couple of examples for a long long period of time you sacrificed human beings on places like Aztec pyramids in Teotihuacan. And you'd take some poor schlub and you would take an obsidian knife and you'd rip out their heart and show the beating heart to the sun because otherwise the sun wouldn't rise or the rains wouldn't come. And not only was it considered moral, it was considered essential for the continuance of that society for somebody to commit human sacrifice. We later learned that it's not necessary to do that, so we quit doing that. But that's happened across time and again. If you'd been in a time machine and took you back to Paris not that long ago, the great squares of Paris were filled with guillotines, and people would dress up in their weekend finest and take the kids to watch somebody's head being chopped off. And mm. after the head was chopped off, they'd hold it by the hair and show it to everybody. And of course, everybody on this call sees that as a savage behavior. And why would anybody do that? Um, there's a lot of things that were legal, moral, necessary, that everybody taught was right, that have flipped 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And are the implications of this one that our descendants one day we'll look back on what we're doing and say, you were heathens in X, Y, and Z area. So that's exactly the key point that is just incredibly important for everybody because you, one of the most boring books on the planet is the HR manual you get when you enter a new job or the code of conduct that you get when you enter college. And the reason why it's so boring is because all of the, all of the people on this call know what's in those documents, you know. And if you don't, then you probably shouldn't be working with these nice people or studying with these nice people, because these are principles that you have been taught that you know you shouldn't treat people in the wrong way. You shouldn't lie, cheat, steal. Although we seem to have forgotten that for a few years. Um, so as you're as you're thinking about that part. That's what makes ethics in most people's mind unchanging and boring. But if technology fundamentally changes ethics, if it changes our notion of right and wrong, we're in a period of exponentially accelerating technology. 
And that means that what we consider right and wrong not only can flip 180 degrees, but it can do so in ever shorter time periods. Yep. And tell us then, Juan, uh, on this area of technology and the role that it plays. I mean, if we look today, we hear a lot of negative references to issues on social networks, as an example, misinformation, disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. But you say in the book that actually technology is a net positive in many areas of ethics. Say a bit more about how technology can help. So... Let me go into a subject that most academics wouldn't go close to today because it is white hot. And that is the whole issue of indentured servitude, of serfdom, of slavery. So start with the fundamental premise. There is no scenario under which it is right to enslave another human being, period. It has always been wrong, period. There, right? I mean, there is nobody on this call that would ever consider slavery to be okay. But that leaves two really important questions on the table. If everybody on this call knows that slavery is wrong, why did human beings practice it for such a long period of time in the new north of the United States, in the south of the United States, in India, in China, in Greece, the Incas, the Mayas? the Slavs, it, it, as you go across cultures, as you go across millennia, the enslavement, the indentured servitude, the serfdom of other human beings was acceptable and legal for millennia across an incredible array of cultures. In fact, it's very hard to find cultures where that wasn't part of the structure. So if all of us know that is completely wrong, why do they accept that for so long? Hmm. And then the corollary of that question, which is really important is, why did it go away legally? Because I understand there's still slavery today and there's still mistreatment of human beings today, but legally it went away in most countries in a very short period of time. And certainly that had to do a lot with the incredibly brave people who put their lives on the line, with Harriet Beecher Stowe, with Harriet Ward Beecher, with uh, Frederick Douglass, a whole series of people who spoke up and put their lives on the line. But there's a second aspect to this, which is also really important. It may not be a complete coincidence that slavery began to go away globally when you started using energy. Why? because a single barrel of oil contains about five to 10 years of a human's labor. So that's the energy equivalent inside a barrel of oil. And you also started having an industrial revolution. So all of a sudden you had machines that provided thousands of horsepower, plus the energy input that provided thousands of human being energy. And all of a sudden a machine or a series of machines could do the work of 10,000 people. And it may not be a complete coincidence that there was a technological revolution, an industrial revolution, just about the time that slavery started becoming illegal in almost every country in the world. Interesting. And is there also kind of a communications aspect to technology that raises awareness about things that shouldn't be? So communication for a very long period of time was incredibly inefficient. So you think of the vellum manuscripts that had to be hand copied. And then you think about the impact that the first printing press had, right? And you think about things like the Protestant Reformation where you, you couldn't have had something like that if you couldn't print a whole lot of alternatives very quickly and have people become literate. Recently, You've taken what I was taught as a child, and, and look, one of the things that really hurt me when I wrote this book is it, it forced me to face a series of really uncomfortable facts. I was brought up to be a bigot, and I didn't intend to be a bigot. I didn't intend to discriminate against human beings, but, but the fact of the matter is I went to a Jesuit school in Mexico 
And they took us to mass every day at 7 a.m. for an hour in Latin. And I got to tell you, every person that I loved and respected, the preacher, my teachers, my peers, my parents, my friends, my newspapers, government, everybody told me that one of the worst things you could possibly be is to be gay. And that being gay was against God, it was against this, it was against that. And by the way, that was the majority opinion in the United States that there should not be gay marriage in 1997. So in 1997, two thirds of the United States said no. Now, when you start getting technology, bring different cultures, bring different lifestyles, bring different ways of looking at the world into your home. When the people that are on your TV screen, in your theater, in your school, A, come out of the closet, and B, come into your screen, come into your movies, come into your television set, and you realize it's not us and them. They are people who we like, we laugh with them, we learn from them, we identify with them. And, and when you do that through social media, when you do that through television, when you do that through a whole series of media, public opinion flips in a very short period of time from two thirds against to two thirds for today. Mm -hmm. And even some of the more conservative elements like the Pope flip in three years from this is against God's will to who am I to judge to now we shouldn't be discriminating. And, and so you're seeing a 180 degree flip on something which many people consider a fundamental moral rule law issue. And it's just fascinating how quickly technology has broken down this wall, exposed us to people, made it impossible for us to consider them as others that should be discriminated against and hurt. Mm -hmm. How do we know one? You've, you've made a very compelling case that technology's helped in many of these cases. It's shortened up kind of bad actions and, and, and raised awareness. How do we know we're not at an inflection point that actually going forward, technology is going to end up being misused and create greater problems than it has in, in the past? So there's... I don't want to leave in anybody's mind the notion that I think technology is 100% on the side of good, that it is not seriously misused sometimes, that it isn't used to hurt people often. But I do want to leave the impression that instead of thinking of technology and ethics as two separate subjects, you should think of them as subjects that interact and alter one another. And I do want people to understand that Technology often flips our notion of what is right and wrong for good because it gives us alternatives in terms of how we can treat people, in terms of what we have, in terms of how generous we can be. As, as we have more, I think in a weird way, it enables us to become more moral human beings. And you can see that with the environment, which is, Again, almost all of us right now understand just how important it is to protect the environment. But it takes a society an income level of somewhere around eight to ten thousand dollars before that society starts protecting its forests, its animals, a whole series of things on a consistent way. Mm -hmm. So in, in in a way, the better off people are the lower the likelihood of having an excess amount of children is. So in other words, the, the lower the population pressure and the more money there is to focus on clean water and to focus on national parks and to focus on conservation. Because it, it's very hard not to cut down the trees if you have nothing to warm your house or you have nothing else to sell. Mm -hmm. um, what we can't do in this world is leave a whole series of people behind and assume that they're going to follow what we consider to be right and wrong and important, like conservation, like addressing global warming. 
we saw that in this pandemic, right? Think of the virus as something that is going around the world playing slot machines or lottery. And there's a one in a million chance that a particular version of the virus will evolve so that it becomes more contagious hmm. and so that it becomes more deadly. The chances are very low on any particular contagion. But if you contage a billion people, Mm -hmm. then what is a one in a million opportunity becomes much more likely. Mm -hmm. And the implication of that is, even if we are able to vaccinate all of ourselves here in the United States or in Europe, you're going to get varieties in Brazil, in Mexico, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in South mm -hmm. Asia, that will then come back and overwhelm the vaccine and overwhelm us all. So we can't build walls against this. We cannot say it's us over here that are protected and vaccinated and it's them over there and it's their problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not enough to vaccinate one state. It's not enough to vaccinate one country. We have to take care of one another in this stuff. There is no us and them in pandemics. There mm -hmm. is no us and them in global warming. Yeah. So Juan, uh, you've made a very compelling case that technology can help improve overall standards of life in a lot of different areas. Say more about the disparity of access though. If people don't all have equal access to technology and educational opportunities and a variety of other things, doesn't that in and of itself create its own problem that can't be managed away by saying the overall is getting better? You're, you're absolutely right. And you know, that leads to a very strange consequence. So the places where I think we've gotten consistently more ethical in our treatments of other people of the world are places where things are getting faster, better, cheaper. Mm -hmm. The places where we still see actions that will be considered completely unethical in 50 years or 100 years are areas where the costs haven't come down or they have been going up. Mm -hmm. So let me contrast the two with two very simple examples when the web was starting to come online the internet was starting to come online there was a whole lot of you know angst and storm and drag around the topic of a digital divide there's going to be a huge digital divide only those who have computers only those who have rich and that was partly solved originally by internet cafes which shared the resource and allowed people to have access. But today, almost nobody goes to an internet cafe because it's gotten so damn cheap. Mm -hmm. So almost everybody is now carrying around the equivalent of the world's largest libraries and their little phones. Mm -hmm. right? So that part, that digital divide, didn't explode and divide the world as we thought it might originally. On the other side, there are two places, especially in the United States, where costs have greatly exceeded inflation, education and healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see the greatest disparities. That's where you do see a disparity between those with access and those without. And, and you get this cartoon of a pharmacist holding out a bag saying to the patient, your money or your life. Mm -hmm. It's literally your money or your life on insulin, right? Mm -hmm. It's your money or your life, or maybe you don't eat if you have to pay for your medicine. I can't tell you how unethical that is going to look in 20 years and 30 years and 50 years. Mm -hmm. right? You used to kill people because they didn't make enough to buy their insulin. You, you used to starve people and allow people to sleep on the streets. Right? That, that's stuff which we tolerate and often don't think about because that's the way the system works. Mm -hmm the way we treat student loans. If I went out and I maxed out 10 credit cards buying a Ferrari and Ferragamo ties and suits and fancy meals and caviar, I can declare bankruptcy. Hmm. Yeah. If I go out and I take a student loan, not only is it an expensive loan, I cannot declare bankruptcy in almost all circumstances. Mm -hmm. That is insane. And, and it creates this predatory college phenomenon 
that creates degrees that often are worthless and saddles the person with debt for a worthless education for life, which is becoming ever more expensive. Mm -hmm. And why we tolerate behaviors like this, which are clearly unethical, which will be seen in retrospect as crazy, is a really interesting question. So is the implication of this, you talked about the two areas, education and healthcare, is that technology has not fully done its magic in those areas in making them you know, less costly, more accessible, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You just look at the cost curves. If, if you want to target unethical behaviors or look at unethical behaviors, first target places that don't look faster, better, cheaper, where the costs are continuing to go up. And we're very good at rationalizing the abuse of other human beings in those systems. Fascinating. Fascinating. Let me ask you another area here in technology, artificial intelligence. Obviously, that's an area that's talked about a lot because of the availability of data, the ability to analyze it, predictive capabilities. You make an interesting point in your book about autonomous vehicles, which may at one point in the future create one of the biggest benefits, the gift of time, et cetera, et cetera. But you mentioned that there are uh, alleged ethicists that are looking at autonomous vehicles and trying to, in good hearted, trying to make decisions about how do you program a vehicle? Who do you hit if you have to get into an accident, et cetera, et cetera. And you basically make a comment that um, the, the kind of ethical discussions going on is missing the more fundamental benefit that autonomous vehicles will create. Could you say a little bit more about that? Sure. So look, all of us have read these horrifying articles about an autonomous vehicle that goes out of control and kills the driver or kills somebody else or something goes horribly wrong or somebody hacks into the autonomous vehicle or the autonomous vehicle doesn't recognize X, Y, or Z. Every single one of those cases is likely to be true. So mm. let's assume that, okay? Let's just grant that. Let's not quibble with the car didn't recognize the trailer and kill the driver or the car hit someone. Okay, let's just accept that as opposed to debate that. The fundamental question that you have to ask is, how much safer does an autonomous vehicle have to be on average than driving with your crazy Uncle Charlie? Mm -hmm. Because cars still kill people today. In fact, it's one of the leading cases of death until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. or people until they are 50 years old mm -hmm. alongside opiates. And, and so if that's the case and you show me an autonomous vehicle that on average makes one half the mistakes of a human being in terms of killing people, mm -hmm. or maybe it's one tenth the number, or maybe it's one one hundredth the number, how safe do you want autonomous vehicles to be before you mandate autonomous vehicles? Mm -hmm. Because if you tell me I've got an autonomous vehicle that yes, indeed, it does kill drivers and does kill pedestrians, but it does so at one one hundredth the rate of the average driver, I would argue absolutely focus on fixing the problems, but deploy the autonomous vehicle as fast as possible because you will lower the deaths by one hundredfold. Mm -hmm. Interesting, fascinating, okay. Makes, it, makes sense. How do you get uh, by the human um, irrational decision making that tends to go into it? Somebody says, I don't want to go into an autonomous vehicle because I'm not driving. There's no driver in there. Regulators that'll say I need to regulate down to that individual accident. There's a series of kind of human behavior areas that may not be fact and data oriented. How do you see change in that environment? That is the question for our time, especially for the next 90 days. That is the question we have to ask ourselves as a society, because when you look at the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine against COVID, mm -hmm. there are literally 5.5 cases per million vaccines of a reaction. So out of a million people who get the vaccine, there are 5.5 cases of people who are hurt by this. 
about 70% of those people, those 5.5, are people who have had serious allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions before. Mm -hmm. So take the people on this call who haven't had anaphylactic reactions, which is the vast majority of us, the chances of any one of us being hurt by this vaccine are less than two in a million. Mm. And yet, there's a whole series of people who are still debating, should I take the vaccine? And this includes people like healthcare workers, where there is a substantial portion of healthcare workers who doesn't believe that they want to take the vaccine at this point. Mm -hmm. and, and that is such inane behavior vis-a-vis -vis the potential benefit when the number one cause of death for most people at this point in the United States is that pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So there's a complete disconnect between the rationality, the results, the science, and the way people are thinking about this. And, and that, again, comes back to education. It comes back to statistics. It comes back to social media and messaging. It comes back to being able to communicate between the lab and the scientist and the society in a way that builds trust and truth. Um, and we've lost that. And, and it's incredibly dangerous when a society loses trust, truth, and science. Not because science is always right, mm -hmm. but because science often admits its mistakes. And it should always admit its mistakes. And it should do so publicly. But, yep. but we're in a very dangerous period for the next 90 days on this. It, it is completely unethical in my mind to tell mm -hmm. almost anybody not to take this vaccine. Yeah. I'll exclude children because it hasn't been tested on them. And I'd have a more serious conversation if you had an anaphylactic shock. Yeah. Juan, does this, and I'm, we're going to go to questions in, a, in just uh, the next uh, minute here, but does this make you more bearish on democracies? The ability to opt out on some of these, has this been a disadvantage for democracies in dealing with COVID and a variety of other things, or don't go there, that's too much of a generalization? So let me answer that in two ways. It, it, I think it was Churchill, but if I'm misquoting Churchill and somebody else, somebody on the call, please correct me. Um, mm -hmm. Democracy is the absolute worst form of government, except for all others. So, God, you just go nuts when you see some of the things that democracies do. But on average, would you rather be born into a totalitarian system, a fascist system, a communist system, a X system, a Y system? No. Right. If if you take a John Rawls view of, you know, a veil of ignorance, no, you don't want to do that. So the other aspect of this is you can very quickly figure out who's an optimist and who's a pessimist by asking somebody, if I could put you safely into a tube and have you wake up in a hundred years and see how it turns out, mm -hmm. would you do that? Would you want to do that? And optimists curmudgeonly optimist like myself would say, oh, hell yes. I, I absolutely want to see it in 100 years. I don't think I'm going to open up the lid and come into a dystopian Terminator world where everything's on fire and the robots are turning. Mm -hmm. I, I think things are going to get, in general, better. Not in a linear way, not in a straight fashion, but look, if you were a woman or somebody who was gay or somebody who was of a different race, you know, pick a category. Would you really want to be born at random into 1900 or 1800 or 1700 mm -hmm. or 1200? There's a lot of problems today, mm -hmm. but we're pretty well off vis a vis almost every other society across all time. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Let's go to Q&A now, and I'm going to uh, turn over the first question to, to Jessica at the, at the World Affairs Council, and then I'll, we'll alternate here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great discussion so far. So happy to jump in with our audience questions. The first one, um, as robotics and AI improve and technology can be enslaved, 
what is the future for work for humans and the ability to earn a wage and fund many of the social systems our societies are built upon? Should we tax the robots? So there was a thrilling and terrifying meme on the internet just before the holidays where Boston Dynamics um, released this video of five robots dancing. And if you haven't seen it, please go look for it because it is like shocking, terrifying, exhilarating. And, and it portrays a future that's a very different future where robots do a whole lot of stuff. It used to be that people were worked to death and lived on average less than 40 years. It used to be that people started working in the fields when they were six years old. It used to be that people worked you know, in conditions that we would consider inhuman today. And I think a 40 hour work week, paid vacation leave, paid sick leave, which many countries have, much of the United States does not, which is an interesting ethical question. Um, but, but the whole point is, I think I, I could certainly envision a future where, especially for backbreaking labor for a lot of manual labor for even a lot of accounting lawyering a whole series of professions robots or ai take over you absolutely need a tax system and you need a universal basic income and you need a basic level of income for people if a whole series of people are going to be displaced and the work is going to get done it also brings up a really important question of identity and, and I think you have to look at different cultures. So Europeans often say that they work to live. And Americans often say the opposite. They work, they live to work. And so the first question you get in the United States is often, what do you do? Well, that's incredibly insulting when you ask some people in Europe that question, right? Because their identity isn't wrapped up in the job. And I could easily see a 20 hour work week in a decade for people who choose it. I could easily see having a universal basic income in a series of countries. And we are gonna have to transition a lot of our identity, which is tied up in what we do into a different kind of what we do that may not be eight hours or 12 hours in the office. Uh, and this pandemic may have been the first stage of that. Fascinating. A question came in from one of our UCLA uh, students all about misinformation and on social networks primarily and saying, listen, misinformation is easily spread through the technology we use today. It doesn't seem to be slowing. How do you fight this while preserving uh, freedom of speech? You know, I think one of the things that a series of people don't seem to feel in leadership positions for the last few years is shame. So any one of us would not treat the people of Hungary in the way that dictatorship is treating the people of Hungary and eliminating free and open universities, for instance. Mm -hmm we wouldn't want to be treated in the way that Putin treats much of his citizenship. So we've had a whole series of leaders in the media, in politics, in business, who seem to exhibit no sense of shame. And that ethos of the community reacting against the community ethos of, no, you don't do that. You don't take it all for yourself and leave nothing for anybody else. You don't lie every single day. You take responsibility for your actions. Many of us felt on, I think, many sides of the political spectrum that Biden's speech was an incredibly important speech and that the first press conference set a completely different tone. That doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but bringing back some truth, some shame, some accountability for telling lies, 
whether you're doing it on Facebook, whether you're doing it on Twitter, whether you're doing it for the benefit of your business, whether you're doing it for yucks, you know, I, I think having people put their name on this and having community standards allows people to make the choice of what they're going to say, but they should be accountable for what they say and what they spread. So you're and, pointing, this is a leadership issue, not per se a technology issue. We can't blame the technology for creating that problem. It may have helped accelerate a bit, but fundamentally this is a leadership issue. No, there's absolutely a financial incentive because we are trained in a fear response and we're trained in a protect ourselves and protect our family response. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, especially since 9-11, there's been a whole series of things that are designed to scare you. So think about walking into an airport. Right, you're going on your vacation, you're thinking about that pina colada, you're you know, just about to go into the airport pre-pandemic or post-vaccination, and as soon as you enter those doors, if you see something, say something. If you see an abandoned bag, report this to the authorities. You're gonna have your bag searched. You can be searched any place, right? The number of warnings that you are getting next time you go through an airport, just count the number of times. Somebody's telling you, be afraid, be very afraid, keep your eyes open, report it. And, and the news media learned from that. And so you get this little jingle of breaking news alert and, and you, you instantly go, oh my God, now what? Yeah. Right? And, and that has been incredibly profitable for a whole series of media because it's been true for a long time. If it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. Except that has now been gone to the ninth power by Twitter, by Facebook, by Instagram, by this, by that. And, and I do think there has to be some accountability for just pumping people full of fear. It, it's just incredibly destructive to societies to do that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, since this is the World Affairs Council, two thirds, three quarters, of the flags, borders, and anthems in this world did not exist a few decades ago. Hmm. We have been ripping nations apart. We've gotten really good at you know, tearing down flags, borders, anthems, and making ourselves ever smaller. Hmm. And this hasn't stopped because you've got these debates in Wales, in Scotland, in Catalonia, in the Basques, in the hmm. Northern Italians, in the Walloons, in the Southern Finns, and it goes on and on. If we spend billions of dollars in these campaigns convincing 49% of the country or 51% of the country that they are not like the others, we will rip nations to pieces and we will continue ripping nations to pieces. And that is a really dangerous thing to do, which is why when I go to West Point and I have the privilege of lecturing there, the first question I ask the cadets is how many stars will be in the US flag in 50 years? Hmm. And that is a gut punch to those cassettes because they are willing to give their lives for that flag. Mm -hmm. But the next question, the follow-up question is, okay, how many U.S. presidents have been buried under the same number of stars they were born under? And the answer is exactly zero. There has never been a president of the United States buried under the same number of stars he was mm -hmm. born under. And so it's not such a crazy question. Interesting. Thank you. Um, some of the greatest leaps forward in technology have come from developments discovered in creating weapons of war. Can you discuss this dichotomy and do inventors and innovators have a code of ethics similar to that of doctors and diplomats? That is a really important observation because a lot of technology, including today's technology, are pushed because they are potentially useful to war organizations, defense, national security, et cetera. And there's a lot of funding for that stuff. And it's a very scary question to ask because A, it's true that technologies have been pushed by that. 
And B, it's also true that technology is getting so powerful that it's getting really decentralized. So in asymmetric warfare, the amount of damage that somebody can do to somebody else without having the resources of a nation state are increasing year by year, right? So when you think about what it takes to unleash a computer virus that shuts down the lights and kills everybody because the ventilators go down or because you know riots happen or whatever. But, but that is increasing very quickly. And what that tells you for governance is it's ever more dangerous to leave people behind than mad. The, the greater the number of people that you leave behind angry, isolated, that are not a part of a world where we can have more and where we can treat people as us instead of us and them, the likelier that we are going to be that some of these asymmetric technologies are going to be deployed to hurt us and destroy our way of life. When people say the hell with it, I just want to tear it down. I just want to burn it down. I'm not doing this to profit. I just don't, I just want to break something. And, and that's something that important sectors of the United States are close to that on various parts of the political spectrum. That's a very dangerous situation. And that is why a call for unity and a call for respect and a call for listening to people, not dividing people and us and them is just so damn important. Okay. Great. Well, a couple of questions I want to ask that are related here. Um, you talked about some of the benefits of technology, making things cheaper, better, faster, that broadens access. What are some of the areas of technology you're most excited about? And related question is, what are the ethical responsibilities of those entrepreneurs or technology leaders to ensure what they're developing meets ethical standards that serves a community well? So, you know, one of the wonderful things about being in science and technology is every day is like Christmas. So every day brings a new science magazine or a new nature magazine or an MIT technology review or an RBX article or a public uh, academy of science. And, and, and these things are just so mind bogglingly cool, right? I mean, we all of a sudden discover that maybe there's a billion planets that could have life on it. Or all of a sudden we discover forces of supernovas that are just so inconceivably powerful vis-a-vis -vis our puny little things. Or we find <clears throat> that we get closer to cures of cancer or we develop vaccines in 11 months instead of 12 years. All of these things give me an enormous sense of optimism that our kids and our grandkids are going to see things that we have never dreamed of seeing, right? And, you know, a silly way of putting it is that meme of, now I told my kids that I was born before Google and before the internet, and they laugh, right? But of course, that's true, right? And it's, it's going to accelerate. Uh, and things they take for granted are things that we kind of go, that's miraculous. That's so cool. Think, think of the old song of uh, Paul Simon. Um, these are the times of miracle and wonder. And the miracle was the long distance call. Right? which of course we don't think about, right? And, and, and so the point is, this stuff is moving so fast and it's giving us stuff that we just take for granted. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is, you can go nuts worrying about the potential evil implications of this or misuse of this and really harm your country and really harm your jobs. And, and one way of looking at that is, Europe put into place something called a precautionary principle which basically says, I'll tell you what, anytime you bring me new technology, I will immediately approve it as long as you prove to me it will not harm human beings. Well, motherhood and apple pie, that sounds like, why would you ever want to make something that would harm other human beings? Until you begin to unpack that little baby, would you be allowed to build a staircase under this can never hurt another human being? Would you be allowed to put salt on your table? Would you be allowed to have an electric outlet? 
would you be allowed to make anything out of steel? So things that sound like rational policies of, you know, show me this will never hurt somebody, end up being incredibly destructive and bringing back countries hmm. and their competitiveness and their jobs back for centuries. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, this will probably be my final question. How do you think social media has changed our societal ethics in the United States? Technology appears to have amplified the public's ability to express one's personal beliefs of right and wrong, as well as the ability to intend to harm or follow through with a call to action to harm others. Yeah, technology has allowed really nasty groups to organize far more effectively and far quicker and allows you to put together flash mobs that take over the capital. So there has absolutely been a misuse of a lot of technologies. On the other hand, it's really important to note, and especially when you go to what I think is the greatest museum built in the United States in recent time, which is the Memorial in Alabama for all of the lynchings, which is just an extraordinary place. If you ever have the chance to go down there, please go see it. Um, because it, it is heart-wrenching, but it is also an incredible memorial. That memorializes thousands and thousands and thousands of instances which were even crueler than what happened to Mr. Floyd, right? And yet a single cell phone video of what happened to that man and how he was treated didn't just ignite a reaction in one city, in one country, it ignited a global movement because so many people were able to see a broadcast studio in high definition that didn't require a network. So a lot of things that are wrong, a lot of corruption, a lot of violence are being showcased by our broadcast studios on social media to make things better, sometimes, not always. Excellent. Juan, I always like to finish up the sessions I moderate by sharing the this, this takeaways that I got out of the session. I want to share five points that I took away, and I want to give you a chance to upgrade those or share a final uh, remark, either way. But I've got five points I took. The first one is this idea that ethics changes over time, that we think that there's kind of absolute right, wrong, et cetera. And when you look at it over time, ethics change. The second thing is that technology has played a very important role in many areas on raising awareness, as you just highlighted, transparency, et cetera, that it's done a lot that in aggregate has improved uh, uh, our, our standard of living. Third area is a specific, unique benefit of, of technology is this idea of faster, better, and cheaper, that that often has created disproportionately positive uh, gains, and that those sectors in our society that have got problems with them, and you highlighted education and you highlighted healthcare, often are the ones that are not ingesting technology potentially fast enough. But that's kind of been the, the miss. Last two points I've got is a reminder from you about the importance of leadership, the importance of accountability, the importance of um, focusing on facts and sharing facts and using facts for decision making. And that's a leadership imperative more than anything else. And the final message I took from you is notwithstanding a lot of difficult outcomes and issues, et cetera. When you said, you know, look forward a hundred years, you said that that's gonna be a better life for all of us. And that's kind of the ultimate measure about what technology can do and where our society is going. Those are the five takeaways I got. Any upgrades on those or final messages? So that is a perfect summary, Terry. Thank you. Um, better than I could have said it. Um, I think if I had a final thought for everybody, 
we've all been really angry and really frustrated by a lot of stuff for a while. And we're going to be angry and frustrated for the next few months as we work through this pandemic. As we judge each other, as we judge the past, we need to use two words that are not in vogue today, and that's humility and forgiveness. We've got to realize when we judge founding fathers, um, when we judge people who act in ways which are horrible and unjustifiable, that we too are going to be seen in retrospect as having done some of these things, and that things we take for granted today are going to be seen completely wrong in future generations. The actions will change in their meanings, and the words which we use may change in their meanings and connotations. So humility and forgiveness in judging each other in the past is incredibly important. And don't be scared of ethics. This is a fascinating, complicated subject. You're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. But just remember, Nike and Nissan. Mm -hmm. Just do it and enjoy mm -hmm. the ride. Well said, uh, Juan. And, you know, it's a, a very insightful, wise set of messages about a path forward and how we can accelerate good outcomes. So let me just say a huge thank you. I learned a huge amount listening to you, reading your book, and uh, really enjoyed it. Let me, let me turn it back over to, uh, to Kim to close out. Mr. Enriquez. Professor Kramer, this was such a fascinating discussion. We'll have to have you both back, maybe in 90 days, <laughs> so we can, we can talk about your 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 um, future uh, visions and, and uh, projections. For our viewers, we hope that you enjoyed such an interesting discussion today and that you'll continue to help us make these events possible. Please be, consider becoming a member or making a donation you can text the word give to the uh, number on the screen and we appreciate anything that you could do to support us thank you so much to ucla and professor kramer for this partnership today this was absolutely fabulous we have some terrific programs coming up next week which i'll just quickly go through on monday we have the future of u.s policy in afghanistan Tuesday, remember, politics in the time of coronavirus has moved to Tuesday at 11 o'clock. On the um, uh, 27th, restoring U.S. global leadership. This is a conversation with the president of the Atlantic Council. And then the following day, we have a live stream on India's rise. And this is with the director of the Hudson Institute. Of course, February 19th, we've got Bill Gates and his new book on climate change. So please go to our website and register for these events today. Please, everybody stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you Monday.